let's talk about immigration, specifically the arguments over open borders versus closed borders. This has become a controversial topic across history, all around the world, because it's really not just about being politically left or right. It's a subject that will heavily impact our lives and our future. While the mainstream media tend to focus on just one side of this problem, let us take a step back and look at both sides of the arguments, because the conversation about how we should handle this problem can bring up some deep philosophical questions about our choices, values, and even our sense of morality. This is what I would like to focus on. I'll do my best to remain neutral and walk through eight moral dilemmas that have no easy answers. So let's get started. One of the main reasons why people support closing borders is to protect a nation's culture. Supporters of closed borders worry that allowing too many outsiders into the country could negatively impact the existing way of life, causing the native population to feel like strangers in their own land. For example, when the United Kingdom opened its borders more widely, the large influx of immigrants from very different backgrounds, cultures, and beliefs had made some locals very uncomfortable. A large minority of local citizens believe that these immigrants do not properly integrate into their society, and the community that the locals grew up in becomes increasingly unfamiliar, leading many locals to believe that their British culture was being threatened. However, on the other hand, supporters of open borders believe that these changes in culture are actually positive. They argue that cultures are always evolving, with or without immigration, and the diversity they come from open borders can actually make their culture richer and not weaker. But whether we believe in one side or the other, we still have to ask ourselves a big moral question: Is it reasonable to limit immigration in order to protect cultural identity, while some cultural change is necessary and can even be positive? There has to be a balance. How much change is too much? Surely, the answer can't be to have unlimited change without facing any of the negative consequences. So, how do we decide where we should draw the line? This is not an easy question to answer, but it's something that we have to consider. Successful integration depends on whether immigrants are willing to adapt to their new culture, and whether the local society is able to accept their cultural difference. If integration fails, it can lead to division, isolation, and social tension, making it harder for everyone to live together. Another major argument on immigration is about the economy. Supporters of closed borders. Worry that immigrants could take jobs away from local citizens. Since immigrants are often willing to work for lower wages, it could create a very unfair situation and give big companies too much leverage, potentially forcing local workers to accept lower pay for the same job. This is a valid concern, but on the other hand, supporters of open borders argue that immigration can actually be good for the economy as a whole. This is because immigration is an answer to labor shortages. And if companies can hire workers at lower wages, it also means they can charge less for their products and services, and we as consumers can benefit from that. Additionally, an increase in population means more demand for food, housing, and other necessities, which can help grow the economy. But even though immigrants may promote economic growth in the long run, there's still a population of locals, especially from the working class, who end up losing out. These locals. May struggle to keep their jobs or see their wages drop even further. So the real question is: Is it fair to allow more immigration at the expense of local workers? Do they have a moral right to preserve the current situation, or should we still allow in more competition but try to help these workers in other ways? One solution is to provide support to workers who are hit the hardest by immigration, like offering job training or financial aid. They sound good on paper, but unfortunately. It's easier said than done. Most of the time, these solutions either don't work as planned or turn out to be empty promises, and these local workers usually end up being neglected or exploited. Another major concern about immigration is how opening borders would impact state benefits. For example, Sweden is known for having extensive public services. Things like welfare payments, free healthcare, and social support. Are available to all their citizens. However, when Sweden opened their borders more widely, this became a problem because it attracted a large number of foreign immigrants looking to take advantage of these welfare systems. Now, imagine a flood of immigrants moving in every year 
looking for social support and unemployment benefits. The cost could get so expensive that eventually, the country will not be able to afford it any longer. In order to resolve this problem, some governments had even suggested that their country should limit social benefits for certain immigrants, hoping to discourage them from entering Sweden. But this approach also raises an ethical question. If immigrants move to the same country to live and work alongside citizens, contributing to the same society, is it fair to deny these immigrants the same right as everyone else? On the other hand, if benefits are too widely available, how do we make sure state benefits remain sustainable for both immigrants and citizens? Another major problem around immigration is how it might affect the political function of a country. One of the strongest arguments for closing borders comes from the idea that for democracy to function properly, the local citizens need to be united under a shared purpose. This is because in strong democratic countries, citizens need to make sacrifices, like paying higher taxes, participating in politics, or helping to find state benefits and social services. Citizens are willing to offer their contribution because they feel connected to each other with a strong sense of responsibility towards their fellow citizens. However, this sense of unity and shared purpose usually comes from having a common culture, identity, or even religious beliefs. So, according to this argument, if too many outsiders come in, especially those with very different cultures and beliefs, some of them may even push to change local laws and oppose the idea of democracy. It could really weaken the shared feeling of connection and negatively impact the political function of a country. On top of that, when a population is constantly changing, it can make elections more complicated. Many supporters of closed borders are worried that more immigration could lead to voter fraud or that some political parties might rush to turn immigrants into citizens just to gain more votes. This brings up concern about fairness and whether the immigration process could be manipulated for political gain. However, on the flip side, supporters of open borders believe that these fears about voter fraud are often exaggerated. They argue that the real focus should be making sure that everyone living in the country, including immigrants who have become citizens, can fully participate during the elections. Supporters of open borders believe that rather than restricting immigration, the inclusion of more diverse voters from many different backgrounds, cultures and beliefs can actually strengthen democracy by making sure that everyone living in the country is represented and all voices are heard. So, the real question here is, does allowing more immigration strengthen democracy by increasing representation or weaken democracy by undermining unity? This is a difficult question with both sides having some strong arguments. Another key problem surrounding immigration is about security. Supporters of closed borders worry that allowing immigrants from countries with high crime rates could lead to serious problems. They argue that open borders might allow other countries to offload their criminals, creating serious security risks for the receiving nation. On top of that, there is also concern if there's not enough jobs for both immigrants and citizens. People who are struggling to make a living might turn to criminal activity out of desperation. But on the other hand, supporters of open borders argue that despite some high-profile cases, these concerns are greatly exaggerated. They point out that most immigrants are just looking for a better life and are not intending to cause harm. They also argue that focusing too much on security can lead to unfair discrimination, causing certain ethnic groups to be unfairly judged based on their backgrounds or beliefs, making entire communities feeling like they are being threatened. This difference in arguments becomes even more complicated when you think about the bigger picture of moral responsibility versus practical reality. Let's take Poland for example. A while back, Poland had refused to accept certain migrants, arguing that taking these migrants would hurt the stability of their country, and they wanted to close their borders to ensure the security of their fellow citizens. However, the European Union then heavily criticized their decision and wanted to push for all European countries, including Poland, to share the responsibility of accepting these migrants to ensure fairness across the region. But despite the criticism, Poland stood by their decision, insisting they have the absolute right to control who enter their country and even willing to pay a heavy fine to keep their borders closed. Interestingly, according to the Global Peace Index, 
Poland had then since become one of the safest countries in Europe, having one of the largest increases in peacefulness. So, this raises a very controversial question. If closing borders is in a country's best interest, should they still do it despite criticism and to ignore the moral obligation to help others? This has become a very hot topic in recent years because one of the strongest arguments for opening borders is the belief that all human beings deserve to be treated with equal rights and compassion, regardless of their culture and where they were born. From this perspective, it seems wrong for better countries to shut others out while letting the less fortunate people suffer. This is why supporters of open borders argue that refugees who are seeking asylum deserve protection and have a strong moral claim to be accepted into a country. But this also leads us to a moral dilemma. According to the 1951 Refugee Convention, a refugee is someone being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, or political beliefs. This makes sense on paper, but the problem is, this definition also leaves out a lot of people. What about those who are escaping from civil war, poverty, or natural disasters? These people are also in terrible situations, but why don't they deserve the same help and protection? This raises some big questions about who should be accepted into a country and why some people deserve to be helped more than the others. Another big debate on immigration is about irregular migrants or undocumented migrants. These are the people who have settled in a country without legal permission and if they were caught, they could be deported. But what if these irregular migrants had lived in a country for many years should they eventually earn the right to stay? Some supporters of open borders, including political philosophers, argue that over time, many irregular migrants have built their entire lives in the new country. They work, raise families, and might even have become part of our community. At a certain point, it feels like these people should have earned some moral right to stay in the country and perhaps should be given a path to become citizens. But on the other hand, supporters of closed borders argue that it's not that simple. To demonstrate their point of view, imagine if someone has stolen an item and kept it hidden for 20 years. Does that mean they now have the right to keep this stolen item? Similarly, using the same logic on irregular migrants, just because someone has been in a country for many years doesn't mean the government shouldn't deport them. However, this argument will get even more complicated when involving children. Even supporters of closed borders would agree that children who are brought into a country illegally by their own parents shouldn't be accountable for their parents' actions. But what if these children had lived their entire lives in the country and have fully adapted into our culture, sometimes without even knowing their legal status? The question is, should these children of irregular migrants be deported or should they be given a path to stay? And even if these children are granted asylum or legal status, what happens to their parents? They shouldn't be spared punishments, but deporting them would mean separating them from their own children. Again, this is a tough dilemma with no easy answers. Now, let us move on into something even trickier, which is the selection process for immigration. Every country has their own way of choosing immigrants. Some countries use lotteries, others go by first come first served, but most countries we we'll look at criteria such as language, educational background, and working skills to figure out who will be best suited for the country. This sounds completely reasonable, but here's where things get complicated. What if these criteria happen to be based on race, ethnicity, or even religion? Can it be acceptable for a country to include this as preference to figure out which immigrants have the strongest chance for a successful social and cultural integration? These kinds of selection actually happened throughout history. For example, in 1901, when Australia first became a federation, there was a law that was created called the Immigration Restriction Act, also known as the White Australia Policy, aimed to not only restrict numbers of non-white migrants to Australia, but also to deport undesirable migrants who were already living in the country. Today, most of us, including the Australian government, would agree that policies like this were unfair and go against the idea of equality. Excluding people based solely on their race is just wrong. 
and it's clear why this policy has been widely criticized and was finally abolished in 1966. However, when it comes to immigration, most people would agree that countries should still have the right to select immigrants who are more likely to adapt to their shared values and culture. Trying to maintain social harmony and cohesion is very important because a few integration of immigrants can result in parallel societies within the country that could lead to conflict and division. After all, a government should protect that country's stability and be able to decide what is best for their society. But the real challenge is, when it comes to selecting immigrants, how do we set criteria that are practical and necessary for successful integration without crossing the line into discrimination? And why are some criteria considered acceptable, while others are not? Even ideas like shared values or cultural fit can be quite subjective, making it difficult to select immigrants without bias and may end up excluding people one way or the other. Finding the right balance between helping those in need and protecting a country's interests is really difficult, which is why we should consider both sides of the argument, honestly and openly, because the choices we make will shape the world that we live in.